Welcome in to Bears Weekly, a Chicago Bears Network production. Download the Chicago Bears official app, brought to you by Verizon, to follow the team on the go. Bears Weekly is brought to you by Advocate Healthcare, Athletico Physical Therapy, Bet Rivers, CD Kelly, Connie's Pizza, IGS Energy, and Miller Lite. Here are your hosts, Jeff Choniak, a.k.a. the Mayor of Bearsville, and his sidekick, Tom the Surfmaster Thayer. We're at the NFL owners meetings in Orlando, Florida. Welcome into a Monday edition of Bears Weekly on ESPN 1000 of the Bears Radio Network with my broadcast partner, Tom Thayer, the Super Bowl winning Bears guard, and Jim Miller, the former Bears quarterback. He is Sirius XM NFL Radio's Moving the Chains. You can catch him every afternoon along with Pat Kerwin. And he's, uh, he's, I'm in a hotel, Tom, outside of the, uh, the expensive zone where the, C- the JW Marriott and uh, the Ritz-Carlton, I- I'm just, you know, a little guy down the road. And Jim is right there on Radio Row a- in Orlando and kind enough to yes. take some time today. So, yeah, and Tom, you're you're at home. Well, yes, I'm at home. I'm still aware of everything. I am not don't have the luxury of going to Splash Mountain later like you probably do. And Jim, is he works seven days a week. So, you know, it, it seems like this is when the NFL season st- starts a serious kind of um, – you know, rolling downhill towards the season, whether it's rule changes, you know, the, some of the pro days have already taken place. You kind of understand how what's happening in the draft and how it may unfold at the top part of it. So just another step in the NFL season. You see what the, what Jeff left out, though, Tom? Yes, I am at the JW Marriott. <laughs> J- Jeff conveniently left out that he's at the Ritz-Carlton is no, where he's at doing, not, doing this show. I'm not, I'm not at the Ritz-Carlton. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it, they do put on a great show, don't they? The NFL, I mean, the owners and their families are here, obviously. And it's, it's a lot of work uh, going on. And, of course, the Bears are at the center of the universe again. And Ryan Poles in high demand for interviews. I uh, met with uh, Matt Eberflus. You'll hear that uh, coming up on Bears, et cetera, this week with Tom and myself on Wednesday, the release of that episode number 61. Check it out on the Bears platforms or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, But it's also a little time to get reacquainted with the other uh, members of the NFL. And uh, there's always some social aspects, golf, you name it. A lot of things going on here. But but there's also the serious business of taking stock of your roster, taking stock and, and giving the opinions of what happened to the media and then also looking ahead to, to rules changes, and we clearly focused on that. We're going to get into that as well as today with a one-on-one interview I was able to do with General Manager Ryan Poles. We'll be hearing that on our next segment. Also, thanks to Jack McGrath and Sean Graney, our producers, our Bears producers, Dan Barilli and Jordan Treadup. A lot of discussion about what the Bears did at quarterback. I'm going to start with Tom and move to Jim. The reasons why are are many tiered, but not the the least of which from Ryan Poles, as we'll hear in our interview, is that this this was a business decision in terms of of the cliche of resetting the clock on the quarterback, and that salary structure for five years gives them some runway to as their research has has learned. This is when you can strike if you've got already good things in place, which the Bears do. This could be a monumental gold moment for the Bears. Uh, leaning towards, obviously, Caleb Williams, but doing their due diligence on the other quarterbacks. You know, I have a lot of respect for Ryan Poles and the work that he had to put in because you're talking more than just one quarterback and Caleb Williams or Daniels and Drake May. So, you know, Ryan had to do a lot of investigative work when you're talking about considering uh, the most important position of all professional sports. And, you you know, if you have the opportunity to make a, a – organization changing uh, play, you know, Ryan's got to do it. And it's unfortunate because I think that we've all said how we feel about Justin Fields and the type of person he is. However, when you're looking at the ultimate goal for the Chicago bears and that's winning a division to go to the super bowl, you have to take all that into consideration when you're making this difficult of a decision. I think the process is just starting. Obviously he's had, uh, you know, the three days that they spent with Caleb Williams, out there at the USC Pro Day, and it's just a get-to-know pro- process. I don't think it's set in stone yet that it's just anointed uh, that'll be Caleb Williams. I, I think they're going to continue to do their due diligence on Jaden Daniels. He is a five-year starter who's played better every single year that he's played in college, and I would think uh, Drake May is as well. They need to do their due diligence on him as well, not only just for this pick alone, 
but potentially, you know, a landscape in, in the future. I think we know quarterbacks, uh, this quarterback carousel has moved pretty fluidly here this offseason. Justin was a, a part of that uh, move as well. It kind of cleared the deck for the Bears to to make this selection at, at number one. And I think we all know they, they'd be not doing uh, justice to themselves if they didn't do all their due diligence on all the top quarterbacks that are coming out. I know it looks like Caleb Williams is anointed, but I wouldn't ignore those other two quarterbacks either. Yep, and that's the case. Uh, uh, Tommy Ryan is headed uh, right from here, from Orlando to Baton Rouge, to take a look at Jaden Daniels. And uh, I know there's even a ton of talk uh, at the AFC breakfast this morning, and those people don't know it, every coach is available to the media all at one time on these big round tables, and there's a lot of media here. And, Jim, I want you to talk about that in a second too. But, Tommy, it's a lot of conversation about quarterbacks, the, the whole thing's about quarterbacks, and, and even – Pittsburgh and Mike Tomlin, a man we respect, said in his opinion, the reason they went and got uh, Justin Field, they feel there's a lot of meat left on the bone. And that's, uh, you know, only only the way Mike Tomlin can say it uh, for for him. And, and I think we'd all agree. But this is this is a continuing process. And the entire conversation, the entire conversation is about yeah, but quarterbacks. You, quarterbacks. You think about it, you know, you think about it, Jeff, you think of you got two guys that are approaching one, you know, right. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, uh, Kirk cousins, they both tear their Achilles and look at the amount of money that they're going to make for each of their teams. You look at the amount of money that Russell Wilson's going to make from the Denver Broncos. And he's not playing for the Denver Broncos. He's moved down to the Pittsburgh Steelers. You have a guy that's 25 years old like Justin Fields, and he's moving on before he gets into his second contract. You talk about the success of Patrick Mahomes over the years. Then you got your Josh Allens and Justin Herberts. Why isn't the quarterback as much of a topic of conversation? Then you think what, what the Dallas Cowboys are going through with Dak Prescott. So it's a topic that's never going to leave the forefront of the NFL. And then you talk about the talent group that's coming in out of college. They have a first tier group of guys, and then they have a second tier group of guys that could be equally as talented in the long run of their career. So I I don't think this is a conversation that's ever going to go away. And no matter if you're asking a guy like Andy Reid to Mike Tomlin to Matt Eberflus, it's first on a lot of press people's minds. And that's the first question they get asked. You know, the fact is, and I, I think I mentioned this last week, maybe I didn't, uh, Jim, you, you were on the show late uh, last week, but there are only six quarterbacks in the league that have won a Super Bowl. So that class of 21 quarterbacks of which Justin was a part of, they're all in different places except for the kid in Jacksonville. Right. I mean, well, they, I, and then and, and they're calling, they're talk, there's talk, and I don't know, Jim, can you even attach this? It's almost sacrilegious to say uh, the 83 draft, of quarterbacks they're they're calling this crop of quarterbacks similar to that crop of, you got some hall of famers over there in yeah. 83 so i don't i mean are yeah. we leaping too far yeah well and think about that dan marino was the last quarterback taken in in that draft of that class of 83 you know it's interesting that that jim harbaugh can make that statement because They've got Justin Herbert, so he can make a <laughs> statement like that, yeah. that he is, you know, trying to promote McCarthy, and we all get that and what he's trying to do, but they do. They drive drafts, and I wouldn't be shocked if a team takes a flyer on Bo Nix out of Oregon. You know, he's kind of shooting up as well that maybe he could be the last quarterback taken in this year's draft, potentially in the first round. He is a look and feel to me of a Denver guy because of Sean yeah. Payton. I don't know, maybe. All right, we're going to take yeah. our first break. Tom, hold your thought. I know you got plenty coming, and so do we. We got the general manager of the Chicago Bears, our exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview coming up next here on Bears Weekly on ESPN 1000 on the Bears Radio Network. This is Bears Weekly with the voice of the Bears for 23 years, Jeff Joniak on the Bears Radio Network. Welcome back to Bears Weekly on ESPN 1000, the Bears Radio Network. Jeff Joniak with the general manager of the Chicago Bears, the very busy Ryan Poles. That's the case in every offseason. But this one, I think, probably tops it all. Would you agree? Yeah, I would agree. There's there's a lot going on, but it's uh, it's been a, a fun ride so far. Yeah. Can you take us into that world, pull the curtain aside a little bit? What's it been like? And how have you guys put everything into context, into 
How are you going to attack this? Yeah, I think the big thing right now is we're just excited that we're adding some really good players uh, to our football team um, using free agency, trades, um, but also, you know, even extending Jalen Johnson, uh, who's a key member of our team and, and someone we're going to look up to in terms of our, our leadership. So let's start with JJ because that secondary is popping right now. Yeah, I think we've been real clear. You know, the guys that we, we pay um, and extend to be here for a long period of time, we expect that leadership part to be a part of their role. Um, it's been a really cool process. I've seen Jalen grow as a human being, but also grow as a leadership al along the way. Uh, so the timing's perfect, and uh, I know he'll continue to improve himself, but also bring others along um, with him, which, you know, I watched him do with, with Tyreek Stevenson last year. All right, tell us about free agency, because we know you, you're a draft-driven general manager. You, you're, you're trying to stick to that, uh, but there's players that, that are necessary at the time you continue to stack these years of, of building this football team, and so you, you went out and got a bunch of guys, um, offensive linemen, safety, Obviously, the running back, DeAndre Swift, and the trade of Keenan out. There's a lot there. Kind of take it in pieces a little bit. What your plan was, and did you did you get what you wanted? Yeah, we did, and, and probably even more. Um, you know, we want to be op opportunistic. Um, when, when certain situations pop up, we always want to have the flexibility to be able to capitalize on it. And that really is because we've been disciplined uh, along the way. Um, so really kicking it off with, you know, DeAndre Swift, uh, something that's going to allow us to be versatile, uh, create mismatches all over the field. Um, I'm really excited to add him. Uh, Gerald Everett uh, and Keenan Allen are two guys in the passing game. They're going to allow us to be dynamic um, and then continue to improve our offense and, and put more points on the board, which we all know is, is really important to win championships. And on the defensive side, you know, we talked about Kevin Byron. He's a guy that has had a ton of production, uh, on-ball production, and again, his leadership, his experience in this league is, is really going to allow Brisker to, to improve himself. So these guys are going to be multipliers. That's what we we're looking for, impact players that can multi be multipliers on our team and allow us to take the next step. Let's talk about the trade of Justin Fields. So I was out and about on Saturday uh, during St. Patty's weekend, and bam, it hits. Every Bears fan walking around had an opinion, you know, and that's, that's kind of what you anticipated, right? The, the opinions are on either end of the spectrum, but what matters most is how you feel this helps the football team moving forward. Uh, how difficult was it? And if you can explain how it all unfolded. Yeah, one of the more difficult things I've had to do here, um, and I think it makes it really, really hard because of the type of man Justin Fields is. Um, but I knew taking this job that when you're in a position of leadership and you're in charge of getting this team to where it needs to go, you got to make hard decisions. Um, so that's what we, we had to do. We felt was going to be right for the Chicago Bears to move forward. Um, I think the narrative of Justin versus another person is a little bit off. It's more of the timeline that we had with Justin on a rookie contract um, that really enables us to continue to, to have resources and, and grow as a football team is really the, the focal point there. Um, but absolutely one of the hardest things I had to do, uh, even going home and telling my son that was not an easy <laughs> thing to do. Justin's jersey is on our wall, uh, framed in our home um, because of, of how I feel about, about Justin. Um, so really hard thing to do, but I truly believe this is the right thing for us. Um, and it's going to set us up to be really successful um, as we move forward. So when you make that call, or I don't know how you did it, um, What's that conversation like with Justin? And, and unless you want to keep that private between you and him. Yeah, I'll keep the, the context of it private, but it was important um, for, for both Flus and I to make that call together. I actually went to, to Coach's house um, and we made that, that phone call together. We just wanted to make sure he knew how much we appreciated him um, and just give him some reasoning behind it. Um, and he had some very kind things to say about the organization and, and about the leadership in our building as well. Um, and we wished him luck as he was moving forward. Um, I think the key thing, too, is I said that the combine we want to do right by Justin, put him in a good situation. Um, and I really believe uh, we were able to do that. So I was one that said, hey, why not both? You know, just see how it all plays out, have competition. Was that ever a consideration? Yeah, we, we really worked through every um, situation um, because, again, it, it wasn't easy to move on from Justin. I know the impact that it has in the locker room. Uh, I know the impact he has with our fan base. Um, but as we talked through it, we didn't think it was going to be a healthy situation for a young quarterback to get up and get started. We didn't think it would be fair to Justin. 
Um, so really to kind of have a fresh start on both sides, we thought was going to be best um, and allow whoever comes in here to be the quarterback, the Chicago Bears, allow them to really have the opportunity, a true opportunity to win his teammates over um, and again, um, take the next step and, and grow. Well, the Bears are going to get a quarterback now. Uh, the question is who? And, uh, you know, the, the first step in the process, obviously, was the USC Pro Day and Caleb Williams. What struck you about your conversations with him over the several days that you were there? Forget about the on-field work for a minute because, you know, those Pro Days are, are, are what they are, and he was fantastic. He was, he was very good. But just, as you say, looking a guy in the eye and getting to know the guy and what he's all about. Yeah, just his background, uh, what he believes in, you know, all the way down to his hobbies. What, he, what does he enjoy doing? Uh, leadership style, um, good conversation to go through, you know, adversity. Um, and on the other side of that, have tremendous success at, at a young age. Um, how did he deal with that? Um, so we really wanted to get a full understanding of, of who he is in a, as a man and, and who does he want to become and what, what things does he, he want to achieve both on an individual basis, but also from a team perspective. So we continue to gather information and, and again, create clarity as we move forward, but um, very effective and uh, productive uh, visit out to LA. And, and I'm assuming he'll be at Hallisaw soon. And will you continue to vet all the quarterbacks? Yeah. Yep. So I'm actually going to leave uh, here from Orlando. We're going to go to LSU um, to kind of finish up uh, our um uh, Pro day journey, at least for for Coach Flus and myself, um, and then we'll head back and continue to do film work on on all the guys. And uh, again, we want to turn every every stone and make sure we're making the right decision um, on, on all the draft picks. But um, we're gonna do a thorough job of that and make sure we're we're on the right page. All right. So having one in nine, um, are you getting calls? Um, it's uh, I have I've I've gotten I've had some conversations. Um, I have, um, but just not ready to kind of go there right now. Yeah. 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 Uh, do you feel you're in a fantastic position though of strength? Now I know just four draft picks right now after all the moves, but do you still feel that you can get aside from the quarterback, some players here that it will make instant impact based on your draft slots? I do. Uh, my entire scouting staff or front office, um, we're really, really excited about the opportunity that we have and the type of players that we can add to our roster. Um, the cool thing is, as you look at our roster, it's going to become harder and harder for, for guys to make our team. Um, and and that, that means we're getting better. That means our roster is getting more competitive. And I know the more competitive your roster is, um, the better team that you have. So uh, we're excited about the opportunity we have. And, and again, you know, I just, as I look forward, I get really excited about, who this team can become. You folks can't see it, but the man is smiling. So yes, he knows, he knows what he's got going on. Uh, last couple questions. Uh, do you feel free agency for you is on pause? Will there be more things you're interested in potentially? Yeah, um, it's on pause for right now. Obviously we're always gonna, you know, keep our ear to the ground and, and stay opportunistic, but you know, from uh, a spending side of things, you know, that's gonna slow down significantly. You know, we're going to start shifting over to the draft and make sure that we make some really good decisions here in April. Got to go back to Keenan Allen. Had an opportunity to sit with him and, and talk, and I was blown away. I mean, the guy's done just about everything you can imagine, uh, but it's a first time in a new new team, new city, and he shows up in Bears gear. I don't know if that was planned. I don't know what, what the story is there, but uh, were you surprised he was there, number one, or was he invited to be there, number two? And what did that mean to you to see him there at USC? No, there was no request for him to be there. He knew we were gonna be out there. Um, he knew about the pro day on his own and he made that decision, which again speaks you know, volumes on, on who he is as a person, how much he loves this game and how, how much he wants to be successful. Um, so that blew me away as well. And I certainly didn't tell him what clothes to wear either. <laughs> um, and he came representing in the, uh, in the, in the blue and orange, which was which was cool to see. And, and that got me excited. That that just was confirmation. I already knew, but I had an extra confirmation that um, he's exactly who we thought he was going to be. Again, that leadership, the experience, the wisdom that he has with this game. Um, you know, we are, we are going to have a young quarterback uh, in the building. And 
he's a guy that can just really share a lot of really good information to allow that player to be successful. Third year, you have dudes on this team now. Yeah. You agree? Like yeah. this team is, is, is coming together here. I know there's always going to be things you want to add, perceived holes, whatever the outside world may think, you may think different. The strengths of this team, you may think different. Um, as you look at this roster and penciling in in your mind who, who the quarterback will be, uh, in addition to that, how would you put it into context for us? Because we've been really fortunate with uh, some really unique situations with draft picks, um, because we've been disciplined with our, our spending, and you know we kind of took it on the chin in, in year one to clean that up. For where we sit right now, it, I'll be honest with you, it's exceeded by uh, wildest dreams in terms of uh, really getting this roster into championship form. Um, and I truly believe that. I mean, we push each other to make sure that we're, we're doing right by the roster, right by the organization, and, and that we continue to add talent uh, to win championships. So um, really proud uh, of how far we've come. But at the same time, you know, I think I said this last year, it's on paper. Um, I know it's better, but it's on paper. It's got to come together. Um, but this is a little bit different because I think we have continuity now, and I think we have guys that are going to continue to to make each other better. Um, I mean, I got the linebackers and DBs flying out to L.A. to work out with each other. You know, I, you got offensive guys talking with each other. You got vets that are just trading, showing up at college pro days. Um, the character of this team is special and and again it's on paper it's got to come together when we play games and it's got to result in wins um but it's uh it's definitely something i'm proud of all right one last obscure question should the nfl uh, competition committee pass the new kickoff rule will that alter how you now look again at special teams coverage return all of that does that factor in as you look forward absolutely you know anything to make the game exciting um as well as safe, um, I, I think it's important to the game. And, you know, we'll see how the votes go and if it gets passed. Um, but absolutely, it's been on my mind all day today is, you know, what changes do we need to make um, to make sure that we're effective and efficient um, on the kickoff if, if it does change. So um, there are going to be some roster implications that we got to plan for. And I kind of texted my guys earlier today just saying if, if this goes by, we're going to have to have some meetings and think of things a little bit differently, um, again, so that we are uh, top-notch on special teams as well. Well, thank you as always. Appreciate it. Absolutely. That's Bears General Manager Ryan Poles back with Tom Thayer and Jim Miller after this break on ESPN 1000 of the Bears Radio Network. This is Bears Weekly with the voice of the Bears for 23 years, Jeff Joniak on the Bears Radio Network. This segment of Bears Weekly is brought to you by IGS Energy. And if you want VIP access, including exclusive seating, sideline credentials, and more to every Bears home game next season, join the wait list to get the ultimate VIP fan package in 2024 by visiting ChicagoBearsVIP.com. Jeff Joniak, Tom Thayer with Jim Miller from Sirius XM NFL Radio is moving to change. Uh, it looks like you have something significant. To well, say. Jim what started it. What Jim says the 83 draft was my draft. And so I went to the combine with all these guys and you look at John Elway at number one, then they decided Todd Blackledge was the next best quarterback at number seven. And then Jim Kelly, 14, Tony Eason, 15, Ken O'Brien, 24, Dan Marino, 27. So if you think that this has become a more educated science since 1983, it really hasn't. So I think this year's draft is equally as complicated in the decision-making process as that 83. And that's just the first round because you're going to have a good quarterback somewhere in this draft that's picked in the third or fourth round. That's going to come out here and have a really good NFL career. So when I, I I just dwell on the 83 draft because I was there and I saw those guys at the Combines and I played in all-star games with them. And then to shockingly see how these guys went out and did their evaluations, were so specific about the different things that the criteria they were looking at behind the scenes, and that's, and that's what happened. I, I just uh, – I, I think in two years when we're doing this show again – it'll be interesting to go over this year's draft and see what happens. 
Well, you know, the one thing, uh, the cautionary break is, and Ryan Poles indicated this uh, this morning with the local Chicago media, is that, you know, expectations are going to be zooming. Because everybody's saying, and, and Ryan is, is equally agrees, like the Bears have a, a unique setup going on. They've got talent. They're coming off a seven-win season, not a one- or two-win season. They've got a culture established. they got continuity now entering year three. They've been building to this. And just because you're going to draft a, a kid number one overall doesn't mean this team is ready to, to immediately. There, there's going to be bumps in the road. He, it's going to be a young quarterback. They're going to have some things they got to work through and some adjustments. And the coaching staff has been put together in such a way that almost every base is covered here. I mean, they are putting all resources to make it as not easy as possible, but as comfortable as possible to learn this job, which is so difficult. And in a city like Chicago, where the media attention is insane and the expectation from a fan base that is thirsty, you know, they made it as, as, uh, as a nice a transition as you possibly could imagine for a young quarterback. That doesn't mean it's going to be simple at all. Right, Jim? No, it's, it, yeah, it's going to take time. I think we know that none of these quarterbacks, you know, are, are you know, 100%, you know, clear shots that they're going to be stars. They all have flaws. It's going to take time. you got to be patient with them. But I agree with you, Jeff. I think they're they're trying to insulate a young quarterback as much as they can. When you make a trade for Keenan Allen, typically when you've got a young quarterback, you put the veterans around the young quarterback to insulate him. You've got that with DJ Moore, Cole Komet, uh, Keenan Allen, who they just added. You just added a, a veteran running back in, in DeAndre Swift. So I, I think they're they're trying to, you know, make the, the plate as full as it can to insulate a young quarterback. But there's always going to be growing pains. I think we understand that. It's another level of play. It's not college football a- anymore. And these young quarterbacks are going to have to learn that. And that, that just takes time. And hopefully the, the patience will be there, not only from the fan base, but I think from the organization to really bring along a young quarterback the right way. I, I think they get a bit an understanding of how much information that can put on the plate of a young quarterback when they go through meetings and take it out into OTAs. It'd be different if during that 83 draft, when you went from the draft to live training camp, I don't think quarterbacks were really given the opportunity to really have a lot of that information sink in where they try to go and make use of it in full padded practices almost immediately. So I I think Shane Waldron and his offensive staff and having the opportunity to mentally get these quarterbacks prepared so they can be at their most confident uh, confident when training camp begins. I think that'll be interesting for everybody to see because there is going to be an unbelievable group of press out there at every open opportunity at Bears practice just to watch and see the development of an offense and how it fits a new quarterback. So as you heard in our interview, uh, Ryan, it was very difficult for him in the end to uh, make the move because of the person Justin Fields is. And Justin was very gracious uh, about it in his departure. Uh, Also working with Coach Eberflus closely on this, getting players involved. They reached out to certain players to let them know uh, what their plan was. And uh, the players were flattered by that, that they were, you know, informed of this just because of how they felt guys like Cole Komet and some others. And then, you know, now now the job is not done. Job is not done, but Ryan trying to do everything and, and not make make sure every stone is unturned so there's no second second thought. You know, you just, you're going to, whenever the decision's made, he said that he's not there yet. And uh, you just got to keep grinding it out and making sure everybody takes a look at everything. And it's not just about the quarterback position. They have three other picks at the moment that they have to do the same due diligence on. And they are, you know, what's interesting to me, guys, he talked a lot about, so as they have scouts do their thing and they've had the most eyes on these guys for the longest period of time. Now the coach is getting into it. And if something doesn't match up movement wise from the combine or pro day workout, they're, they're tasked now, if they like a player to go back and figure out, was that a, just a, a moment in time where something didn't look right, or is this something that can't be fixed? Or can we work with a guy like this? The depth of this process um, is not just, okay, I love that player because I want to, you know, you always go to the game tape. 
the game tape tells the story, right? But there is more to it than that, and they're really going deep on this stuff. Because, again, you have the number nine. We can't forget they have the number nine pick. That's going to be yeah. a most important pick, no matter what it is. You know, medical yeah. evaluation still is an important yeah. part of this. Because you have to make sure that if you're going to go and take a quarterback or one or whomever you're considering at number nine, that these guys are healthy. Again, just a quick story. In 1983, Don Mosbar knew he needed a back operation, but he didn't tell anybody. So when teams would come to USC and meet with them, he would be sitting in a hot tub. And he would have them interview there, not telling them the whole time that he already had his back operated on. So then the Raiders go and take him in the first round. And then after the draft, he says, oh, by the way, I had my back operated on, so I'm not going to be ready to go. So that's just past examples of the history that uh, that Jim and I have been around. But again, I still think you have to understand how important that part of the evaluation process is. Lou Canellis is here, the big Lou. So just thought I did. The, the big wigs have come to town, just to let you guys know. You want to show your face, Lou? Yeah, he, he's so, interrupting our show. He's what he's doing. He's yeah, interrupting our yeah. show. He's he's killing our flow right now. Uh, yeah. But but Jim, you know that that yeah, Tom's point is well taken and and yeah. expected that in the, one of the visits, Caleb will be there the first week of April up at Hallis Hall. They'll take care of that then, and yeah. they're not expected to, to find anything out of the ordinary. Yeah. Well, yeah, because it is a big part of it. I mean. Yeah, I think the only thing he's had is a hamstring in his past, but, you know, you got to do your due diligence. You know, he, di- he didn't take the physical at the combine, and I think we know anybody that signs a contract, the first thing that you're going to have to do is go through a physical in order for it to, to have approval. And so all those things will happen in, in due course. And over this process, because I think you bring up a good point, Jeff, at that number nine spot, that could be a coveted place for the Bears to potentially trade down for all the reasons we mentioned earlier. That slot, because if you look at the teams behind the Bears at 9, Minnesota at 11, obviously could take a quarterback. They could trade up, and it could be a coveted spot where the Bears could trade down, or say Denver. Maybe those two teams, because Denver selects right after uh, Minnesota, that those two teams could be jockeying with the Bears to get up to potentially take the the, the quarterback, because I think that's about the the right time frame that he could possibly go, and the Bears could be in a good spot to get trade down, get a more haul of, of picks, and complete the process of the, what they're trying to do to fill out the roster. With Tom Thayer, I'm Jeff Joniak, and Jim Miller, back with more here on ESPN 1000 of the Bears Radio Network. This is Bears Weekly with the voice of the Bears for 23 years, Jeff Joniak, on the Bears Radio Network. This segment of Bears Weekly brought to you by Athletical Physical Therapy. Visit athletical.com to request an in-clinic or virtual appointment and start feeling better tomorrow. Jeff and Tom and Jim Miller from the NFL owners meetings in Orlando. Let's take a look at the roster. Some things that Ryan Poles says as well. You know, offensive line, I asked him about, you know, the, the, the reasons for coming up with a bunch of veteran offensive linemen. He just felt that that's an area where he never felt yeah. comfortable. And that uh, uh, Ryan Bates is going to start out at the center position. And that's that's where the competition will begin at the center position. Of course, uh, they also have uh, other options there, the draft included. But uh, Coleman Shelton, the veteran they got in, seventh-year man out of Washington, could be for that position as well. And I know this is music to your ears, Tom. As many offensive linemen as you can get in there that can compete and get the best uh, eight or nine guys that you're going to go to we- war with every week. It is. You know, I am I like to see these new guys come aboard. You know, I think it's an upgrade on paper. We'll have to see, though, in performance. But, you know, Jeff, I still have concerns about Nate Davis and Tevin Jenkins because as much as I think Nate Davis is a heck of a player and I think Tevin Jenkins has the ability to be one of the best guards in the division, it's about being there every day. When you think of the conclusion at training camp last year, when Tevin Jenkins pulled his calves and then Nate Davis didn't practice at all in training camp. This group needs to be together for a thousand reps with a new quarterback and a new center before that you think you're going to be ready for week one of the regular season. So as much as we're enamored with uh, some of the resumes of these new guys that are coming aboard, I have as much concern for the guys that are already there to make sure that they live up to their billing because they, they are, they're highly thought of, but if they play up to their standards, 
Chris Morgan could develop one of the best offensive lines in the division. Again, I think that's at the position of nine where if the Bears trade down, that's when the tackles are going to start to go. You know, if the Bears want to, say, draft a left tackle and have bookend tackles with Darnell Wright, or you've got two really good centers that are coming out. Obviously, when you look at uh, Jackson Powers Johnson out of Oregon, and don't forget about Graham Barton out out of Duke. This guy is a very versatile player. Everybody projects him as a center, but he's played both guard and he's played both tackle positions. And the guy stepped in right away at Duke as a true freshman and went against Aleem McNeil uh, from North Carolina. And this kid's a really good player if you do want to. And it's I know it's not a sexy pick when you take, say, a center in the first round, but it's been a solid pick over time. Look at Travis Frederick when he was drafted first round by the Cowboys. He's an all-pro player. You know, you look at Nick Mangold when he was drafted first round out of Ohio State by the New York Jets. I mean, that guy is a borderline Hall of Famer. Uh, so I do think it's uh, – you know, offensive line, typically, as Tom mentioned, with the continuity, you, that's really, if you're going to work in the trenches, that's where a team is really going to go if they're big and up front and on the offensive line. You know, Jim and Jeff, I want a guy on the offensive line that's drafted for what he is. I don't want to, oh, I think this guard can play tackle, or I think this right tackle can play left tackle, or, you know, some type of an experiment player. I want a guy that has thousands of reps of evidence that the coaches and the scouts have already looked at to know that, look, when he's inserted at that position, he's a ready-to-go type of guy. And kind of that's the unique things about an offensive lineman. It's not a three-technique defensive tackle moving up and down the line of scrimmage or a pass-rushing capable defensive end. If you're a guard, you're a guard. If you're a center, you're, your skills show that. So when you go out and you evaluate these players, bring me what they are. Don't bring me an experiment during training camp to see if I can develop them to that position. And then if they don't, then you have a glut of players at one position. Now your glass is overfilled. Well, what about the tweeners? Because last year, so many tackles that were drafted, many moved to guard. I mean, I think Skaronsky is one of them. I don't know if that's his permanent position, but – if I, is that off the table for you, Tommy? Yeah, it, it is Jeff only okay. because look, um, you know, Tevin Jenkins was brought in here to be an immediate starting left tackle at an NFL level. And he really didn't play there, but he is, he's a really good offensive guard. So if you're going to bring me a tweener that all of a sudden can't, doesn't have the length, the footwork, the balance to work out a tackle, and now we got seven guards in two tack, you know. So bring me the guy that has that length that is specific to a tackle. Give me that guy that's lived in a left-handed stance if he's going to play left tackle. That's what I'm saying. Don't bring me an experiments. Bring me a bona fide guy. Jim, where are you at on that? Well, I think – You know, you can play with certain players and you can move them around. I mean, that's Tom's point about Jenkins. You know, he's kind of had to bounce around and now he's found a home at guard. You know, I think when you go into this draft, like J.C. Latham from Alabama, he's a right tackle. That's what he is going to be in the National Football League. Now look at uh, Olu uh, Fashionu out of uh, Penn State. To me, he's strictly a left tackle. And if that's what you want to, you know, these are plug and play players, just how Darnell Wright was specifically targeted for right tackle. I think that's the direction Ryan Poles wants to go in for all the reasons that Tom said. They don't want an experiment. I think they want a plug and play player that they know will be at the position that they're going to select. Tom, this is why I could never, ever even dream of being in this position of like, oh, if it's a, uh, I want to be a general manager on a billion dollar enterprise because I'm at number nine. And I've literally, in the last couple of weeks, had a couple of nights thinking about what I would do. And I don't know what to do because the crop of tackles are so good. And if you get the guy out of that bunch, yep. like, how do you pass on a 10-year tackle? You know, the Bears haven't had one since Jimbo Covert. Uh, you, man, but boy, I tell you, these receivers, man, Roma Dunze, he'd, fit, he'd be an unbelievable fit. He's definitely going to go in the top 10. Do I keep it? Or, you know what, I got to have an edge rusher. I got to complete this defense somehow because where am I getting this? So what do you like? What do you do? Like, have you guys gone through this exercise and think 
got not just for fantasy football sakes or a mock draft, like what is the absolute best decision for the Bears at number nine? Just saying they keep it like out of those three spots, like what do you do? First thing I would just take in consideration, what position am I, am I most desperate in need of? And is that a complimentary defensive end across from Montez Sweat that helps the interior of your line play better, but now it gives you a lack of focal point for the opponent you're playing and give more one-on-ones to the outside? If you think that's your most vulnerable position and you need to get more sacks, then that's where you have to think. You gave up 50 sacks last year. If you think I have to get better at the offensive tackle position within this division and you think there's that guy out there, and like Jim said, now you got book on book and dedicated tackles to the position they've been playing. You're talking about putting together an offensive line that could be as sturdy for the next t- eight, eight, nine years, however many years they stay together and perform at a high level with a rookie quarterback. So I think as if you are the general manager, you have to ask yourself, where am I the most vulnerable? And then you have to fill that void. Look, I don't mind trading down out of nine because there's 26 receivers in this draft that have a top four uh, grade on them, top four round grade on them. So maybe there's that guy that, man, he took a little bit of notice when I was at the yeah, senior bowl or I was at the combine or something that can help me work out. But vulnerability, I think, is you got to fill, you have to fill that. All right, we'll pick it up and look at the rules, potential changes that will come down the pike here, hopefully tomorrow, at least uh, a head start on that as we continue. From Orlando, Florida, where Jim and I are, and Tom is watching from afar, loving every second of it. (laughs) This is Bears Weekly on ESPN Radio and the Chicago Bears Radio Network. This is Bears Weekly with the voice of the Bears for 23 years, Jeff Joniak on the Bears Radio Network. This segment of Bears Weekly is brought to you by CDW. If you're able to get it and get the ultimate VIP fan package this season by visiting ChicagoBearsVIP.com. The chatter there, all the uh, the royalties coming by Jim Miller's Sirius XM NFL radio site along Radio Row. Yes, there is a Radio Row here in Orlando at the owners' meetings, and for good reason. Everybody who's anybody in the NFL from the ownership, their families, general managers and head coaches are here. And, Jim, I don't know, did you dip in much to the AFC breakfast and listen to any coaches today? And if you threw us a few nuggets at us, what did you learn? Well, I think, yeah, I think uh, the the big talk has been about the new kickoff return. You know, it sounds like that is going to be tabled. They'll continue to address it. Obviously, next month they'll have another owner's meetings, and they'll probably go over that scenario uh, again. But kickoff return, because – so much time is going to have to be dedicated uh, to that, like in terms of your practice time, how it's going to look, how situations are going to unfold. And so I think that's something that they're going to push out into the future while they continue to discuss it. And I want the kick return back in for uh, kick return back in the game. I think for all the reasons that Bears fans just saw Devin Hester get elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, it's become an inconsequential play and they can still you know, make it a safer play. There's no doubt about it. And I think they can make it a more exciting play with what they're discussing about it. You could have reverses, you know, put back in there, throwback passes, all type of things that that special teams coaches would make it less impactful in terms of the the gunners that are coming down and they can make it a safer play. And I think it'll be exciting for all the fans if they do and they can come to a resolution to really – now it's tabled. Address it again next month, and hopefully it'll be back in the game. All right, good. I'm glad you put a timetable on it. It has to be done this year. You can't have yeah. a Super Bowl again of touchback, 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 put me to sleep, go to the bathroom, Agreed. get a drink. Um, this plan, Tom, I love it. Uh, I know they made already an adjustment. If it's a, if a touchback flies into the end zone, that, the yard line will be the 30, not the 35. But the creativity and the strategy, and more importantly, as you heard in the interview with Ryan Poles earlier tonight, you do have to have a serious talk with your personnel department and coaches. What do you guys need now? Because body type, type of players, this is now going to, we're going to go back to building the third phase of the, of the football team, Tommy. And we, I think it's necessary. It's, I, I talked to chairman George McCaskey, George, Please, can we get a kickoff? And they definitely want is just that safety 
a- angle of it is is critical. Tom? I, I think it's ridiculous that they shelve it because what you're doing is you're giving the uh, special teams coordinator less time to get ready for it. They have plenty of video evidence that they can put a demonstration tape from the other leagues that have already used it. And I think it's a super transferable, exciting play that, yeah, maybe you do do some different personnel groupings because you probably have to put better blockers in behalf of the receiving side of it than you do on the the pursuit side of it. So I just wish that they would come do a a clear-cut decision and make the change and get that play back in football, which at one time they called the most exciting play in football. Yeah, and and you're right, Jeff. I mean, think about players like Matt Slater from the – from the New England Patriots. He was drafted specifically for special teams, you know, or kick returners like Cordero Patterson or Devin Hester. I mean, teams don't dedicate those draft picks anymore because it's become such an inconsequential play. And Tom, you're right about the personnel side of it too, Jeff, because now that you're taking that 40 yard dash out of it, it's going to become a a hand to hand combat. So I think you're going to see bigger guys on the kickoff coverage teams and the kickoff return teams and that you're going to dedicate draft picks uh, for those specific pur- purposes. Because now that 40-yard dash is gone, and it's going to be hand-to-hand combat up there because they're only five yards a- away from one another. Yeah. Uh, uh, Eamon Agbamiga is already in the house, and he's an outstanding special teams player coming over from the Chargers, and that was a, a former fifth-round pick as well in the National Football League. Or Excuse me, undrafted. My bad. Undrafted. Uh, out of uh, Oklahoma State by the, by the L.A. Chargers. Jim, anything else you picked up uh, from head coaches uh, this morning from the AFC that uh, have any carry any impact? Yeah, I think uh, when you look at the, the crackback block or what they call basically a, a chop block, you know, if, uh, say, a wing, maybe an H, is coming in motion behind the center and they're running an emo block, which is a end man on the line of scrimmage, they don't want them to be able to to go low. But to me, that's a football play. It's been in the in the game for a long time. It's why defensive ends and outside backers practice the ball drills. For for anybody who's listening to this, they basically have to be able to use their arms to push a player who's coming in low to basically take their their legs out. Uh, you know, to me, it's 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 not a typical crackback block. The end man on the line of scrimmage can see that it's coming, and the players are already coached, uh, you know, to to take on that that particular block. And so, I hope that's, uh, you know, I hope that doesn't pass. To me, it's just a, a football play. And but again, everything comes down to safety. And if they deem it a, a you know, a play that is dangerous, then it potentially it could pass. But the coaches that I talk to. Just think it's a typical play and that it's something that that shouldn't be passed. And I hope it doesn't go through and have approval. I agree. You know, I mean, we had a play that was called 49 year geo wing crack. Dennis McKinnon was the most ferocious crack back blocker in the NFL at the time. And teams became aware of him. And it was it was a factor because when he faked in motion that block and went on a pass route, it opened up big play opportunities. And then you go back and you look at the Pittsburgh Steelers against the Chicago Bears when Lewis Lips came to crack back on Otis Wilson. And Otis Wilson dropped him with a forearm because he knew what the guy was going to do. And so, I mean, there there's different factors that can help the offense or it can help the defense if they're aware of it. So it's been in the NFL for quite a while, and this is the first time that we're discussing it about a change. Yeah, so a lot, a lot of different things, tweaks, you know, going on here, and that is the major focus along with what's been done. And then I look forward to the draft. It's going to be a fun ride up to draft day, Jimmy. I know you'll be in the thick of it for sure. Tommy's doing his homework, and uh, we'll keep rolling it out for you uh, each and every week here on Bears Weekly. All right, that's going to do it for us, Jim. And enjoy the uh, the NFL party tonight. I, I know you'll be headed over there here after the show. Yeah, I'll save a diet soda for you, Jeff. All right, I appreciate it. Tom will tell you how it all is and how what 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 happens here in Orlando, Florida. Number nine. See what they're going to do at number nine. You got it. Thanks to Jack McGrath and Sean Graney. Thanks always to uh, my guys, Dan Barilli and Jordan Treadup. And we'll talk to you next week here on Bears Weekly. Coming up next, Black and Abdallah. This has been Bears Weekly. 
on ESPN 1000 and the Bears Radio Network. Good night, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Chicago Bears Network presentation of Bears Weekly, hosted by the mayor of Bearsville, Jeff Juniak, and Surfmaster Tom Thayer. Podcasts are available on the Chicago Bears official app. Bears Weekly has been brought to you by Apple Podcasts, Bet Rivers, IGS Energy, and Miller Lite.